Why don't we start um, talking or giving that you give us a bit of, of background on Wirecard? Wirecard is mostly acting uh, behind the scenes, enabling other players like telco players um, to establish a mobile wallet. M Marcus, why don't you give us a bit of background to the profile of Wirecard? Uh, let me first say we are the first time at DLD. I'm fascinated by the, this kind of platform, and I think this, this entrepreneurial spirit that I can feel here is exactly what we need more also in Europe. So congratulations to the team of DLD, uh, and welcome from my side. To answer your question very shortly, uh, Wirecard basically came up as an online payment service provider. This is where we come from, and then we constantly added value chain. We bought into a bank, five years ago, so today we are covering for online merchants uh, the p complete value chain of payment processing, of acquiring, uh, of risk management. Uh, today we provide a powerful multi-channel platform, so what we have been discussing before, that there is a convergence process, uh, process ongoing in terms of uh, technology developed for online, also going to mobile and also going to point of sale. I think we're already there today, and we're today already able to uh, provide to a merchant an outsourcing model where on a white label basis, he can outsource all his uh, credit, debit card, and uh, also online payment activities to a, to a single source partner. This is where we come from. Okay, very good, understood. Now, let me dwell on your idea of convergence a bit. Honestly, you have been a consultant in your previous life as well, right? Um, we have been talking about convergence in our industry for more than 10 years. Right? I remember, and uh, the telecom representatives here might remember as well, the SIM pay activity 10 years ago or so, it didn't happen, right, finally. Why is convergence happening now? What do you think are the new kind of trends on the demand side, but also on the technology side, making convergence really happen? I think there are multiple factors. There are some analytic factors uh, I will come to in two minutes, but there's also a very important soft factor. I think the mobile phone, of course, driven by the smartphone, I, and, and of course, also, I would uh, summarize here tablets, has become a very important lifestyle platform. So already today, people are doing a lot of additional functions that have nothing to do, of course, uh, with, with giving a call. I think this, this lifestyle element is a, a very important element. And of course, it could become for a new generation lifestyle, not to have a physical wallet, but to have uh, a wallet fully integrated in their, in their smartphone. I think this is a soft element. And there are, of course, a lot of technical elements. Uh, we have a technology today called NFC, near field communication that really can be a standard that can be rolled out globally. So, uh, and that is mature and that is really, let's say, the right standard to go forward. We have for some niches a standard code, QR code. A lot of cell phones already can speak that. So I think we have a combination of soft elements and technical elements that today are the right precondition that uh, we can go forward. And I think this is the main reason that we currently globally so, see so many initiatives, might it be from internet giants, but might it also be from the big telcos to, to go for the mobile story. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, you're saying, unlike the last time, the demand side and supply side, if I may choose my consulting words, are coming together. So it's really a need, a lifestyle need, so to say, and at the same time, technology is available to make that all happen. Then let me turn my question around. Are there actually still any impediments? What might stop the, the, the discussion about mobile payment or the trend towards mobile payment? Is there anything that can come into our way that this will not happen, as we all envisage? Yeah. Uh Perhaps before I come to, to answering your question, let me give you a third trigger that is very important, especially when it comes to emerging countries. I think in emerging countries, mobile payment could be a catalyst to bring unbanked into a, at least a basic infrastructure of banking. A good example is, of course, in, P in Pisa in Kenya, Kenya, but there are some other examples. So I think 
in our developed world, we have this lifestyle element, and I think the trigger will be that uh, mobile payment will be the basic infrastructure for a lot of additional services in the area of couponing, of location-based services that uh, uh, Mr. Marcus from PayPal before uh, put out. Peer-to-peer, -peer, of course, uh, that was referred to by Mr. Schuster. So I think in our environment, in our developed world, it's mainly about additional value-added services. This is one major trigger uh, in the emerging markets. It's very much bringing unbanked uh, and bringing a cash society into at least a first level uh, of, of payment infrastructure. What could be the obstacles? I think the obstacles, uh, and here I think uh, the internet industry could be a very good benchmark. If I look at the online payment market today in Europe, about 80% of online transactions are at the end of the day still running over classical payment solutions. So it's basically invoicing, which is of course very uncharismatic, it's cash on delivery when we come into Eastern Europe. Uh, it's of course credit cards, it debit, it's debit cards, and perhaps 10 to 20% of transactions are really running over fancy new online payment solutions. So that's the reality. I think a success factor over the internet was that uh, the industry started to take the consumer from where he stands. And taking something like a Visa or MasterCard and enrich it with online technology so that he can use something online that he already knows from the offline world. And I think the success factor here will be the same. So I think you really have to bring uh, people step by step from their collective mindset. And of course, we're not only talking about early adopters, but we have to talk about a mass product here. Uh, I think uh, we have to bring the people step by step towards uh, this uh, innovation. And of course, an obstacle could be if, uh, like in the first phase of internet, we expect that tomorrow every behavior will change. Normally, consumer behavior changes evolutionary and not revolutionary. So I think we need some bridge technologies that really this, let's say, this end game that we have, for example, on both sides, NFC technology, and there's really a, a complete streamlined process between a mobile phone and perhaps uh, a mobile app at the point of sale. I think we have to bring the consumer and the merchant step by step towards this direction. Okay, I, I'd like to come back to this point, but before I do so, you, you mentioned um, the emerging markets, emerging countries. Uh, I think at this point in time, we could also say Wirecard is quite active in Asia, in East Asia, right? Indonesia and the like, with recent acquisitions. Um, and you made the, gave the example of M-Pesa. Uh, I think a nice, uh, nice KPI, a nice quantitative data point around the success of M-Pesa is, as far as I know, I remember, M-Pesa is right now processing more than one-fourth of the total GDP in Kenya. I mean, that speaks for itself, right? I mean, uh, an M-Payment platform, which is more than an M-Payment platform, actually, um, is really essential for the economy of an uh, African uh, country. Um, and I guess you see similar things in, in Asia. I will, would like to come to the kind of differences between geographies later in the panel, when we have David and Rene on the stage as well. But I would like to test you once more on the obstacles, impediments. You know, with a, you're, you're a German-based company, which is rare, actually, in this kind of uh, innovative and payment space, um, don't you see, for example, the, the very German concern around data security as, as an issue? What, what's, what are your experiences around security concerns? I would say if we generally talk about risks, of course, we have generally, let's say it's a banking product, so we, uh, uh, the products have to fully comply with local banking regulations, and of course, the products also have to comply with local data protection standards. I think these are two important elements. And of course, every new technology can be manipulated. So. Mankind never brought up something new without somebody finding a way uh, to manipulate it to the negative. So of course, new risk profiles will come up. I think the message is, if we put it simple, as let's take a product that is now brought up by uh, O2, 
uh, we can protect this with PIN code. It's a fully PCI compliant product. And you have an additional element. The consumer gets a real-time access to his wallet. So I would say, to put it simple, the risk profile is definitely lower than even to a credit card with a PIN code. Because at the credit card with a PIN code, you don't have this real-time access. And of course, uh, the real-time access means that every transaction you do is in real time presented to your wallet. So of course you see if somebody else is doing transactions. So I think, yes, of course there are uh, new challenges that have to be that I have to overcome. I think this is why it is important to build partnerships be between companies that have good access to the consumer. And for example, companies like us that exactly know how to comply with bank regulations, that know the data protection standards in the different countries. Uh, but I think they, they will not be obstacles, they will be things to manage, and they definitely will not prevent the mobile revolution. Yeah. No. Actually, I would have expected also to hear um, an argument around um, the age of the, the consumer. I, I guess security and privacy concerns are less, less explicit with the younger segments, uh, also talking about the different needs they do have. Uh, but, but I guess it's all um, possible to, to, to manage these kind of, uh, of concerns, as you said. I would like to dwell on another topic very quickly before we open the panel, actually. Um, I looked into your, your portfolio, into your uh, so portfolio of industries that you're supporting as well. And I, I was amazed actually that a large degree of um, industries you're supporting are consumer good companies, including brick and mortar companies. We, we talked about the different industries in this M payment ecosystem. I'm wondering what your perspective is about the retailers and their ability to embrace M payment trends. The reason why I ask is the retailers have probably been the classical retailers, right? The, the kind of uh, um, Tengelmanns in, in Germany, for example, have been very slow to embrace everything around and payment. With your client portfolio, do you see any chance that they will catch up, that they will play a major role in this kind of and payment ecosystem going forward? Uh, I definitely would say yes. Uh, without being cynical, a little bit triggered by the crisis that started in 2008, and let's say the heavy pressure a lot of point-of-sale retailers came under in their physical sales channel, a lot of strong online activities started. So a lot of uh, offline retailers now really, let's say, take the online and also coming up, of course, uh, the mobile story serious. There are real big investments uh, and we see definitely also, let's say, in very conservative industries, we see the understanding that you have to address such new sales channels with a different marketing approach, sometimes even with a different subset of products and uh, with, a, with a, let's say, a real standalone strategy, so to say. Uh, and I think the companies that really do that, they have still a good chance to be part of the story. And I think we need it because we have been discussing before that today between, depending on the countries, 5 and 10 percent of transactions are real online transactions. So uh, if we go into physical world, we have not only Germany, but I think globally still a very large portion of cash transactions. So there are still very big low-hanging fruits out there, for example, bringing cash transactions into the electronic ecosystem, where mobile payment could be a big catalyst. And of course, this could be interesting also for the merchant, because he gets a new access, a new real-time access to the buying behavior uh, of the consumer. So I think there's a lot of in there for the merchant, and this is why I'm quite positive that currently the right things are done. Okay, thank you, Marcus, for this perspective. I'm actually a bit surprised. I, I personally believe they will have huge challenges to overcome their DNA obstacles that you have. They have quite additional DNAs. But actually, that's a good topic to start the panel discussion. Um, I, I think that we should talk about the ecosystem in the, uh, around and payment together with David and with Rene. I guess we're going to get some, some chairs on the stage. While we, we do so, and thanks, Marcus, for the time being, I, I'd like to actually frame the topic a bit for the audience and open it again. Uh, I hope we can 
see very soon the slides on the screen. I have, oh yeah, over there. I have prepared three slides. Um, you know, I want to remind all of us what actually happened in the past. Because <laughs> mobile payment, as I said before, has been around as a trend for at least 10 years. You know, initially led by telcos, this famous SIM payment activity, it basically failed, as we all know. And why did it fail? I think it failed because telcos were not used to collaborate. However, we also had significant, important technology uh, concerns or technology issues to be resolved, and hence my question, also security and privacy concerns. Um, the, the, the user interface was not really convenient, there were no mobile phones available, and you pointed out that, Marcus, um, rightly, that, that there was no really user interface that was um, not grumpy and easy to use. Um, and finally, I would like to argue it could, uh, could also be that the business case was not stable and valid or, or viable for the participants. Now, let me just go one step further. Right now, we do see a lot, a lot of funding going into the mobile payment space. I mean, this matrix you do see here is not meant to be complete. However, it gives you a flavor of what's happening, right? You see, uh, as always, when consultants uh, talk about uh, different space, we, we, we show matrix, we do see the retail space and the online commerce space on the vertical axis, and you do see the um, yeah, transformational dimension on the horizontal axis. So the more transformational, the more at the right players are. There's a lot of funding going on right now. A lot of money flows into it. Many small players. Surprisingly for you, less players with financial service background. Of course, you do see the MasterCards and the Amex and the like. But, well, I could show also some banks in some countries. But as dominant, innovative players, I think it's, they're not really visible. So many things are happening. This brings us to the belief that we could hope for, uh, really, that this time the trend is really there and it will happen.